Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. I'm Matt Holinsky. Got another great guest for you today. He's from the early 1970s. I believe the football seasons for NT of 1972 and 1973. 1974 graduate and a man who was very, very in influential in the North Tonawanda Wall of Fame and the wonderful project he managed to pull off during COVID, the one and the only John Barron. John, good to see you. How are you doing these days? I'm doing excellent, Ed. I uh, recently had knee replacement surgery, but I'm exceeding the expectations of my doctor and my physical therapist, so all good. Wow, and uh, and the meds are pretty good too, aren't they? <laughs> no more of those, thank goodness. But, okay. Uh, they tell me I'll, I'll be dancing the polka on Christmas Eve, so that's good. Very nice. Hey, I, for those of you not aware of you, and I, I don't know why they wouldn't be aware of you at this point in your life, but... Uh, <laughs> Give us a little recap about uh, growing up in NT and your, your high school football playing days. Okay. Um, I will gladly do that. But beforehand, uh, Ed, I would uh, sincerely like to thank you specifically, but also Keith Pascucci, Paul Fries, and the entire organization of the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame for doing what you've done with the recreation of videos, digitizing them for these interviews. I've watched virtually every one of them and I've learned something. I've met people I never knew before or knew existed. And um, hats off to you and to those guys for uh, for those efforts because it's, it's amazing. So thank you because you're preserving this for future generations, which is one of the reasons we did the, the Wall of Fame project at the high school as well for that reason. So thank you. Hats off to, to you guys. Thank you so much for the kind words. So um, I grew up in um, the avenues, I specifically on the corner of 2nd Avenue and Oliver Street. I was uh, born to a family with three older sisters. Um, the girls were 14, 12, and 9 when I was born. So I've told people my whole life I grew up with four mothers. And because of those older sisters, I early in life became oriented to Lumberjack Nation. Uh, one sister was a majorette. One was a cheerleader. So Friday nights in the fall, one would leave the house dressed in, you know, her tall hat and her baton, the other with uh, her, her pom-poms and her megaphone. So I knew from a very early point of my life that there was something special about uh, living in North Tonawanda. And from that location, Second and Oliver, I was a couple of blocks from what became Better Stadium. And I'll never forget as a young kid growing up on Friday evenings in the fall, you could first see the lights off in the distance rising up above what was the stadium. And then suddenly you could hear the drums and the horns as they played the national anthem. And then through the course of the game, the fight songs and the smoke from the hot dogs, you know, and I didn't even attend a game until I was in junior high school, but I knew what it was all about. You know, you couldn't walk down the street where I lived without seeing Pat Campbell in his varsity club jacket or Donnie Solak uh, walking around with his NT wrestling shirt. So I knew from an early point in my life that that was going to be important to me. So it was a, it was a great start to that. Did you grow up in the uh, playing in the Tyro League or the NTAA or did, or did you learn your football from the Sandlot days? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. My dad was 45 years old when I was born. And for whatever reason, whether it was because I was the only son, the only Polish son, he would not let me participate in Little League, uh, Tyro football, nothing. And uh, I held a grudge against my dad for many years, but then I forgave him later um, after after things worked out as they did. But I was a, I was a pretty good street ball player. And um, I, I grew up very close to uh, Jimmy Latchett, who was a cousin of Bobby Wiechek, who I later played with on the on the NT varsity team. And we had some classic games there uh, on, on the street of Second Avenue. And then you went over to Payne Junior High School when you and, and then did you participate as a freshman in freshman football or how did how did how were you able to get into play uh, organized sports if your father didn't allow that at an earlier age? In eighth grade, uh, a bunch of my buddies were playing pal basketball on Saturday mornings at Payne Junior High School. I used to sneak to, to Payne on Saturdays, just disappear for a couple of hours, and I'd play the games. And one thing I was good at, Ed, my whole life was jumping. Um, my parents had eight or eight and a half foot ceilings in our, in our little house. And um, probably 14 years old, 
I could jump up and hit my head in the ceiling and I cracked a couple ceiling tiles. So I got in a lot of trouble for that. But I, I was an athletic kid. I was quick. I was fast. I was very skinny. But um, I, I, I was I was a decent athlete. I did not play football freshman year. I was actually a manager for the team. Me and Gary Tundera became managers and were close to it. The team never won a game that year, despite some pretty talented guys. But um, I did make the freshman basketball team. Uh, after the third game in practice, uh, Coach Rico, who was an assistant coach of Jim Bevilacqua, went up to block a shot of mine, landed on my foot and broke the fibula in my left left leg. So the basketball season was over for me, despite how excited I was that I, I was decent enough to make it uh, against guys that might have played since they were third or fourth grade. Um, season ended. I went out for the baseball team. I made the baseball team. Uh, Coach Mike Everwine, big influence in my life. Um, when I was born, he lived a couple houses down. He moved, but I, I ended up having him as a ninth grade math teacher. Um, the nickname that has stuck with um, Coach Everwine, Ebe, uh, many people, including at his funeral a couple of years ago, uh, and when they inducted him into the Wall of Fame, they, they talked about him being a nickname of Coach Ebe. Uh, I gave that to him. Um, myself, Franny Baker, some of the other players on the team, we used to yell that to him uh, instead of coach, and it stuck over the decades. So that was that was pretty cool. Made the team, played um, partially uh, throughout the season. I did not get a hit the, the whole season. I, I walked a couple times. I scored some runs. I made some good plays in the outfield. Couldn't hit the damn ball. Uh, I, again, blame not playing as a kid, no Little League ball or anything like that, because I didn't know how to handle a curve ball or a high inside fastball. So that was a struggle for me. Um, move on to sophomore year. Um, again, I did not play football. I tried out for the soccer team. I was born with asthma, however, and soccer involves a lot of running and fall is a tough time of year for people with asthma. So I probably stuck with the team for two weeks, quit and never went back. Um, I made the vars of the JV basketball team. And the day after um, we were told we made the team, we come back to practice and Jim Fredhold and myself were called into Coach Merlo's office and told that um, Coach Moore, varsity coach, decided to send three juniors down to play JV and that Jim and I were no longer part of the team. So, um, boy, was that a disappointment because I had worked hard, again, competing now with guys from Payne and Rezel to be one of the 14 to make it and uh, didn't work out. So I ended up playing a lot of intramural ball. In fact, senior year, our intramural team ended up winning the championship. Um, sophomore year, I played baseball. Coach Merlo was the coach. I started a couple of games, again, at no hits the entire time. I'd ground out. I hit some sacrifice flies, but I never got a hit. So at the end of the season, Coach Merlo pull, pulls me aside and he says, Baron, you're probably the fastest guy on the baseball team. We both know you can't hit a baseball why don't you go out for track? So I ended up doing that um, junior and senior year. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but that was kind of my entrance into the sports world. Never got a hit, broke a leg in basketball freshman year, got cut from the JV team, and uh, we moved forward from there. So <laughs> I I worked hard. I, I could run. Um, I could, I, I was a good sprinter. As I said, I was a good jumper. So I actually got to the point junior year, I could dunk a volleyball. I I'm only five ten, maybe shorter than that now, but, uh, I was able to get off the ground and, and that led to some other good things athletically. How did that transition into to football, your junior and senior years? So, um, Ronnie Roberts, Franny Baker, uh, one or two other guys were sitting at a Memorial pool in uh, July or August, and Ronnie Roberts dared us to go out for football. Now, I'm gonna tell you, Ed, I, we did, did go out, but the first day of practice when we started putting pads on, I didn't know how to put a hip pad on. I didn't know what those little circular things were, where they went, so I'm literally watching guys in the locker room. How did they put that and what did they do here? I had no experience other than Sandlot football. Um, but I made the team. I made varsity and all my buddies played JV. They got they got sent to, to JV as as juniors, which was a pretty cool experience for me. But my inexperience led to me. I played one play in my entire junior year. Second last game of the season. We're playing Niagara Falls. 
we score a touchdown and it's time to kick off. And I think it was Coach Williams or Anastasi says, Baron, you're in kickoff team. I floated to my position on the line for kickoff. I floated downfield, but I'll tell you what, I was ahead of everybody else. I ran into the ball carrier, smashed him backwards and jubilantly ran off the field. You know, I was so excited. My one play, my junior year, and that was it. I made a tackle on a kickoff team. But that provided me with a lot of confidence. And the guys that I played with in 73, specifically uh, Chet Weech, who was our captain. Chet I'd known since Gilmore School, has been a lifelong friend, but what a motivating guy he is. Um, he used to lead our practices in such a way that we were exhausted by the time calisthenics were done. But Chet, guys like Kenny Scripp, who, by the way, should probably be in the Hall of Fame. He was such a classic, great running back and a, and a great sprinter in track. A guy named Mike Petrus. I don't know if you knew Mike or of Mike, but one of the toughest dudes to come out of North yeah. Tonawanda. Um, he was a great basketball player, high jumper, anything he wanted to do. But Mike didn't really like organized sports and coaches telling him what to do. But um, Lee Rinkowski, Dave Shinowski, uh, the Pete and Paul Urbano, those guys kind of set examples for me as a guy who had never played football, took me under their wing, made it tough for me. It wasn't it wasn't a uh, easy thing to do, but it was a great year. We didn't have a great record, but that experience was unbelievable for me. Talk about your coaches. Coaches, you, you had Chuck Ramsey, uh, Chuck Williams, Dave Anastasi. What kind of influence did they have on you? Coach Tedder as well. Um, okay. Coach Ramsey, obviously, as the head coach, I, I – they played a two platoon system, Ed, when, when I was a senior and junior, and I was uh, always on the defensive side. My senior year, I was so motivated to play. In fact, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to be a starter, even though I played one play uh, junior year, and I worked my fanny off all summer long. I was running up and down the steps of the stadium, running around the track, running sprints, um, my sister and her husband, my oldest sister, bought me a set of weights when I was in eighth grade because I was a lean, skinny kid. And I really took that seriously. And before school, going to junior high, I would lay on the floor in my living room. You know, I got up to like 100 pounds in the bench press and doing curls and stuff like that. So I, I took fitness pretty seriously and it paid off. We didn't have anything at the school at the time. Um, my senior year after football season, they actually brought in a universal gym and i'm sorry my phone keeps tipping That's like okay. that they brought in a universal gym and that was our first exposure really to uh to any kind of weightlifting and stuff but back to your question um i i went to school with chuck ramsey's son jack ramsey an all-state um diver and a great friend of mine so coach ramsey was always wonderful to all of us um a very bright man obviously his background coaching at tonawanda and i think gibbons lent him to be the logical replacement for Coach Vetter. But he liked the two platoon system, and I didn't interact a lot with him, but I will tell you that Coach Williams made a difference in my life. I look at him as one of the mentors in my life, one of the guys that motivated me beyond belief and had me believing in myself. And so Coach Williams, I owe a debt of gratitude to. Before he passed away a couple of years ago, I got in touch with him. And I actually uh, organized a lunch. Lou Siri, good friend of mine, Myron Annis, and myself went and had lunch with Coach Williams uh, six or so months before he passed away. And I actually found this uh, preparing for our, our call today. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but this is a sheet that um, Coach Williams prepared for the defense before all of our games with our opponents. And it, it's, it's pages and pages and pages of the plays the other team uh, ran, um, how we need to prepare for them notes on individual players or, or patterns that the, the other team ran. So he was a brilliant football mind, a great guy. And I'm, I'm glad he ended up at Canisius college as a, as a head coach uh, later in his life. John, John, that, that, that prop that you had, is that all mimeographed? That's not photocopied. It's all mimeographed. No. Yeah. It's all, it's all the purple print. And uh, does it still smell like mimeographed? <laughs> Uh, so I, after 47 years, I don't, <laughs> it does not, but I'm, I'm just glad I kept it because it was a great thing to, uh, to find the other day when I was, was looking for it. We had a conversation in the past. It, we're talking about, uh, John Kluwak and what was his influence to you in, in, in your life? Clue was, um, our equipment manager when I played junior and senior year. 
sadly, he didn't get the kind of respect that that man deserved from the players. You know, I mean, he was handing out socks and jocks and yelling at us to, uh, to return our stuff and take our salt pills after practice. But my fondest memory of Coach Pluak, um, as you know, he was big into the Football Hall of Fame, the early days of the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame. And I'm, I'm at my locker. This is after my senior year of playing and uh, after track season. And I'm cleaning out my locker to go home for the day. And I hear, Baron, Baron, come here. And I look and here's little Coach Pluak, uh, squad coming down the hallway like a penguin. You know, if you remember Coach, he was only about five foot five, big arms, big, big chest. And he catches up with me and he says, Baron, we're awarding you the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame scholarship this year. So I, I want you to save receipts when you go away to John Carroll for football and, and bring them back and I'll, I'll give you a check next week. So I, I ended up getting a $250 check from uh, from the Football Hall of Fame. Uh, Coach Pluak is the one who delivered it to me. And I, I will never forget him uh, in the hallway that day. And it was a big honor. And it really, in the days of making a dollar five an hour for minimum wage in the jobs I worked, getting two hundred fifty dollars went a long way um, at college. What do you recall from the the, the better stadium behind the, playing in the, on that field behind the, the junior high school? It the first my junior year we were playing a, a, a night game, our first home game, and. The coaches took us to the fields. We rode the bus from the high school. And I had such anticipation. I had goosebumps running up and down my spine to say the, the school that I watched other kids play, where we used to goof around, uh, throwing a football around in the summertime when it wasn't being used, to pull into the stadium that night to see those lights, to look at those stands, the crown field, the green grass. It stays with me like it was yesterday, Ed. That was a big deal. And I have subsequently in years gone by met a lot of guys that played at Ken West at Lewport. Um, their coaches hated that field because they thought it was to the advantage of the, the lumberjacks, the way it was crowned. And if you looked across the field, you could almost only see half the, half the uh, size of the people because of that crown, but it was in such great condition, great scoreboard. It was, it was legendary. And I, I loved every minute of that. As a junior, it's fair to say that you were a good teammate and a good practice player. How tough were the practices every day? Um, <laughs> I look back at those. It's a great question because I remember in tryouts, they ran a drill called a board drill. And they put down, I don't know, it was a six foot long, about this wide board. One guy on one side, one on the other. And the objective of that drill was to get the other guy backwards, push him backwards. And I got my ass kicked uh, by a couple of the, of the tougher guys. Um, but it was a great drill to teach you how to get low on your, on your takeoff, how to hit a guy hard to start with, because we're in full pads at this time. But, you know, there were techniques of dragging guys back across the board. You did anything you could to win. Um, I was undefeated senior year in that drill, but junior year, I got my butt kicked pretty good. Calisthenics were the, the only thing we did. There were grass drills, tons of push-ups, sit-ups, leg lifts. Um, and Chet Weech was infamous for getting us to do leg lifts, you know, two or three minutes with your legs up in the air. And then he's doing crosses where you had to cross your legs and then up and down. And Chet was relentless. But as long as captain didn't let his down, we kept ours up. But your belly was pretty sore after a day of, of leg lifts. Um, another drill we had uh, called the meat grinder. You had, I believe it was uh, a center, maybe one lineman, a quarterback and a fullback against two defensive linemen and a linebacker. Those drills were tough. Um, they, they, they're legendary from Vince Lombardi doing them. I mean, if you look at old NFL films, you'll see replays of that, but we did that at the high school level and that separated the men from the boys. It was a tough drill. Oklahoma, I guess sometimes they call it, we called it the meat grinder. During the course of a week between games, was uh, the hitting still intense? For yeah, we, as I remember, we hit three days out of the five that were available. Um, the, 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 the usual process was games Friday, sometimes Saturday afternoons. You had Sundays off. And then Mondays, um, we, we came in for a light practice and then we did film. Now, I envy the kids of today because if you look at like Max Preps or some of these other um, – sites 
they'll isolate on an individual kid and watch his pattern or watch his run, watch his tackles. Back then, you know, we had eight millimeter, 16 millimeter film. You guys are dealing with it as you do the conversion to digital. It was just black and white, sometimes color um, running through. And you, you ran through the play once if the coach liked it, he'd back it up and run through it again. But that was the only thing we had to work off in terms of film that one day, hour and a half in the, in the uh, classroom watching film. And I, I learned that so many NFL players today talk about watching film 20 hours a week. And I'm thinking back, man, we had like an hour, hour and a half watching those uh, up on a small screen, <laughs> trying to determine how to play better. Back then, what were some of the challenges uh, for you got, for you to play high school football? I wish we would have had weights. Um, I personally was able to do some light w- weight work when I, when I would home with my, uh, my own weight set, but we didn't have what has become and shown to be so important in today's game or the game of the eighties and nineties, when you strengthen individual muscles. I'll never forget when I graduated from college and I, I joined a club and they had Nautilus machine, you could work on your ankles, you could work on your wrists, your shoulders, your elbows. Um, I think of what a great tool that would have been. I, re- I really do. Um, junior year, this is a great story. Uh, for some reason, there was a big thing in football that players should not drink water during practice. And I'm telling you, I'm a guy, I, I, I carry water bottles wherever I go. And you would go an hour and a half, maybe two hours with one break for water. And that was the theory back then. I don't know if they felt it was better. You sweat everything out. And then you'd go in the locker room after the game and Pluak would be there with the salt pills, in, which I don't think was a great medical practice looking back either. Take four or five, six salt pills, you know, followed by some water. And that's how you hydrated back then. Luckily, senior year, things changed. And there was a hose that ran from one of the nice neighbors' uh, houses behind the practice field that was on nonstop. And I was there quite often, actually. Um, looking, looking, but, back, looking back in your high school career, um, what do you think about the equipment that you had, uh, pads and helmets that you had during your era? Junior year, not so good for a guy that, you know, was a third stringer or whatever the heck I was. Um, they had the suspension helmets, which I actually saw, I think, Ray Zaleski in a game hit a guy with his helmet and broke through the suspension. The, the, it was just like a webbing inside the helmet. One or two, maybe three guys that had had concussions in the past there. Their parents bought them air helmets or water helmets, but they were very early in development. They weren't uh, they weren't perfect, but we got a lot of us the hand me downs. And obviously, if I would have played JV, I would have had second and third time hand me downs. The shoes might be cracked, uh, the shoulder pads might not fit properly, uh, but you may do it. It 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 was tough, but um, we may do. You played in a couple of TNT games. Talk about that experience. Man, oh, man. Um, it's one of the things that, as a kid, I dreamed of doing because I went to a, a couple of those games when I was in uh, junior high school. And to actually be participating, you know, they used to do a, a banquet for both teams, Tonawanda and North Tonawanda. I think it was Warren Steakhouse in Tonawanda. So we were actually, you know, dressed in shirts and ties and the Tonawanda guys were there and coaches were giving speeches and stuff. But it was an incredible build up to to that game. Papers, obviously, I, I still have old articles from all of my games and, and having played in and anything that I had pressed in or just the team. And looking back, I mean, there were days of articles coming up, the build up to the team. There was sometimes a TNT booklet with the history and listing all of the games going back to the to the earliest of those games, the scores, um, who was leading the series. Uh, it was unbelievable how excited I was. I didn't play at all in the TNT game my senior year. We won the game. I don't remember exactly what the score was, but it was a, a great game to see the seniors go off with a victory in our final game. Um, that was our playoff. We had no playoffs like they do now. Um, I lived in Pennsylvania Ed, for 35 years, and as you may or may not know, Pittsburgh football is unbelievable. Before the season starts, there's a 100-page insert in the newspapers outlining all the teams and the best players and so many of them go on to the pros for some reason from Western Pennsylvania, but our buildup was the TNT game and that was our playoff. Like I said, senior year, uh, I, I, I got hurt before the Niagara Falls game and I was going to tell you this in a little bit, but I'll say it now. 
Um, my claim to fame for all of my football career is that I got hurt before the Niagara Falls game, which was the seventh of our eight games that year. And a young guy named John Laper ended up starting uh, in place of me because I was on crutches on the sideline. Johnny had 14 or 15 tackles. I couldn't be prouder of him, but I'll tell you what, that was the start of his career. Sophomore year, starting in the Niagara Falls game, and he did great. And we all know the legend uh, John Laper and his career just is incredible. He's a great friend, and I, and I love him. So, have you gone on to the YouTube channel and watched some of your games from uh, your senior year? I, I absolutely have. And um, uh, there are some missing. I saw that you interv interviewed Al from Lewiston Porter. What was his name? Al uh, Lewis? Al, Al um, uh, Rosas. Al, Al Rosas. Exactly. And, and the first thing he talked about was the famous 0 0 North Tonawanda Lewiston Porter tie from my senior year. I don't know what year he was, but um, that game, um, Mark Cizek and I actually tackled a guy in the end zone after he retrieved a punt. The punt hit at the two or three yard line. Cizek and I got down the field real quickly. We tackled him in the end zone. We get up and we're going, safety, safety. Coach Ramsey ran on the field because they called it a touchback, but that game should have been two nothing instead of zero zero. And um, to this day, I believe that it's the missing film that no one can find. That's what that's I understand. That's un that's unfortunate. I mean, and this gentleman called me from San Diego, California, wondering if I had the film because he wanted to see it. You know, he his family left um, and and moved back to California. His father worked for the uh, immigration service, so I'm, it's unfortunate. Do you have any regrets about your high school career? Well, let me let me finish one thing okay, about that. Go ahead. Court. The best hit I had in my entire football career was that game. Uh, and he talked about a guy named Tom Blanco. Now, my recollection of Tom was he was 6'2", 6'3", probably 2'10", 220. And they were running an end sweep around uh, my end. And Louis Siri uh, was the defensive end. I was the cornerback. And Louis hit him low kind of held him up for me and I came in like a freight train and I knocked Blinko backwards he was wobbling when he got up but <laughs> that's another thing in in that interview he talked about how this guy Tom Blinko and I do remember Tom Blinko because uh, I put a pacing on him that day you got a shot at a guy who went to play at, at Ohio State I mean that's an opportunity um any regrets about your high school career Mike <laughs> man um I regret that my dad didn't let me start earlier. I, I, the way it turned out, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a pretty good senior year. Um, I, I, I find old articles and brings back memories, you know, where I might've led the team in tackles. I started out at cornerback and I, and I had worked really hard that summer. And I can't tell you how motivated the junior, the seniors made me my junior year. I used to watch how they would prepare. I would watch Mike Petrus when he was doing drills and how intense he was in practice. And I took that all in and committed myself that summer uh, before our senior year to, to get ready for the senior season. I wanna, sorry, I'm jumping around, but let me go backwards also to, um, to track. Junior year, uh, I was a pretty good long jumper. That's what I ended up doing primarily. I ran some sprints, but mostly jumping. And the last meet of the year uh, was a sectional meet. And for the first time, I jumped over 20 feet, which for a non-novice, knowledgeable, um, long jump historian, you may say, well, that, what's the big deal of that? Well, for a high school guy, that was, that was a big deal. And I'll never forget a day or two after the, the meet, Coach Williams came to my locker room and he said, hey, Baron, Coach Sternen told me you jumped over 20 feet and took fourth, whatever place I took in the sectionals. He said, we're looking forward to big things from you this this next year in, in football. Man, that was like another boost off the ground. I was floating after that conversation. So um, regrets, you know, we we uh, we liked our beer. Um, as you may <laughs> recall, you could you could have beers at 18 or anything you wanted at 18. And of course, if you looked older at 15, uh, we probably did that a little bit too much. Uh, there's a there's a great night. <laughs> During training camp, our senior year, there were probably 20 or 25 NT football players at Rojex. The where Rojek, get, the Rojek Cowboys. You could get in at 14, right? And somebody spotted Coach Tedder and Anastasi coming out of their cars. 
And I wish you could have seen. There were guys diving under the bar stools, sprinting out the doors. Um, but should we have been out drinking? It bonded the team, but it probably wasn't the best for our for our physical preparation for football. Uh, but those kind of things, we probably took the party in a little bit too extreme. A lot of guys smoked, uh, you know, cigarettes, which obviously weren't weren't good for you. And we took um, senior year, we took the Niagara Wheatfield game too lightly, and we actually went to a party. And they beat us for the first time in, I think, eight or nine seasons. And I, I regret that. If we would have been uh, rested and, and feeling better, there's no way they would have beat the Lumberjacks. Did the coaches ever warn you about smoking and drinking and, and uh, the curtail it or cut it out? I mean, they knew. I mean, it, it was really hard not to know in, in, in North Tonawanda in those days. Yeah, yeah. Some of the captains um, told on players and they would get extra laps or, you know, if they if they had broken a rule of any sort. Um, but I don't remember specifics, but other than there were some guys that were indeed caught and, and punished for that. Okay. You played one year after high school, you played, uh, went to John Carroll in Cleveland. How many years did you play? Was it just one year that you, you played? Yeah, I, I got injured. I talked to you about uh, the, my senior year. Um, I actually uh, tore tendons in my ankle. And they taped me up with about 500 pounds of tape so I could play the TNT game. I, if I look back at the film and I could see that I'm, I'm kind of favoring my right leg because it, it was just too sore. And about 42 years later, I had that ankle operated on because I tore the tendon again. And the guy said, I can't believe how much scar tissue there was there. But back in the day, you wrapped it and you just you know walked on it. And I was able to break the school long jump record on that same ankle. So it's kind of funny that that worked out. But uh, John Carroll was a great experience. I went in with high hopes of, of being able to play all four years. There was a kid from um, Canisius High School in Buffalo, Tim Barrett, who was a senior my freshman year. And trying to tackle that dude in practice um, was, was unbelievably difficult. He was an All-American, Division Three All-American. He ended up in the Browns camp um, after he graduated. So he had some high hope. But that's the level of people that were playing. There was a guy that went on to try out with the New York Giants. Long story short, I played freshman year. I was doing pretty good. They turned me into a running back. Um, John Carroll ran a wishbone, and I was a left tail back out of, out of a wishbone, which meant I got the ball a lot. Um, but there were seven or eight freshmen that were competing for the same position. I do remember we played a game at Baldwin-Wallace College, uh, which is where the Cleveland Browns actually practice, maybe still to this day in Cleveland, and it was AstroTurf back when – there was no other AstroTurf around. B.W. Bowling Wallace had AstroTurf, and man, was it fast. We wore special shoes. I think I averaged seven, eight yards of carry um, that night when I did carry the ball. But I still have uh, scars on my elbows and my knees from landing on that turf. It was like plastic, and it just it cut you, you know. So um, it was a great experience, but also I got more injuries. Um, a guy in practice uh, speared me. And my hip pad had fallen down and I got what's called a hip pointer. I was on crutches for like three days because when you bruise your hip, it goes up your chest, your stomach, into your legs. And I missed uh, two games because of that. And then lifting weights at John Carroll, which they had a good program for that. Um, I developed a hernia and I had to have surgery after uh, freshman year uh, back in North Tonawanda at the Graf Hospital. And I tried to prepare to go back for sophomore year. I'd done all the, the training in advance in the spring, done all the running that summer, but it just got to the point where physically I, I wasn't able. So that was kind of the end of my career. Was it hard to take the helmet off and put the pads away? Yeah, I, I was, um, I, I, because of only having really, in essence, played for three years, right? John Carroll was my third year. I was fresh. I, I felt energized. I, I was learning. I was enthused. And Louis Siri, still one of my best friends to this day, also went to John Carroll with me. Louis and I both played freshman year. We were roommates. Uh, we dormed together. And um, he, he played as well. So we both really had a hard conversation when we decided uh, it was it was time. Um, we both ran track. Um, I, jumped, I jumped and ran it at John Carroll in the spring of my freshman year. And Again, in my junior year, I did run track again junior year. So it gave me an opportunity to at least uh, see out some of those glory days. You've lived in other parts of the country. Um, and I'm sure you've had this conversation with people. When they ask you where you're from or if you played high school football, what do you tell them about North Tonawanda? 
it, it's funny that oftentimes I'll say I grew up in a small town between Buffalo and Niagara Falls called North Tonawanda and the conversation will go on. And then the guy will say, what was it like in Tonawanda? And I said, no, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> North Tonawanda. And then I'd go on to tell the story about, you know, the TNT rivalry and, um, you know, the parades and the, and the egg fights and all that stuff. And they would just revel in those stories because not everybody has those. I mean, yeah, there are rivalries in various schools around the country but nothing, nothing like the TNT game. I actually brought a couple of, uh, after football ended, I joined a fraternity and I ended up becoming vice president and then president of my frat. So I kind of, kind of put a lot of my energy into that. Uh, once, once athletics stopped and I brought a couple of my fraternity brothers back home, stayed at my mom and dad's and took them to football games and they couldn't believe how enthused people were uh, regarding NT football. And <clears throat> I did find an article as well, Ed, that, um, Senior year, when we beat TNT seven to six, uh, they missed. Uh, I almost blocked a field goal on the last play of the game, but the guy missed the, and we ended up winning seven to six. There, they the paper said there were thirteen thousand people in the stands that day, and I read a subsequent article that said that was the record year for most attendees, and it was a pouring down rainstorm. The field was muddy; it was slippery, and um, so bringing people back to see Better Stadium, something they had never witnessed, because if they played high school football. They'd never seen a place as nice as that. Very true. Want to want to move fast forward to uh, you took on a project uh, during the pandemic with the, the Wall of Fame, and some people would think that you were kind of crazy to take on something like that and try to raise money during a pandemic. But talk about that process because I've seen the the finished product and it's fabulous. It's phenomenal. Um, it's breathtaking. But uh, what was your thought pattern regarding doing that project? I had left Western New York for 43 years. Uh, my business career took me primarily to Western Pennsylvania, where I lived for about 35 years. Then I, I lived in Florida twice. I lived in North Carolina, did a lot of business traveling. And I decided to move back because those three older, those three sisters that I referred to earlier, um, they're now 80, 79, and, and 75, and I wanted to be part of their lives. Um, I grew up with those four moms. I wanted to be the brother that came back and, and helped take care of them, and, and, and I hope they'll say that I, I have helped in that process. Plus, I got a ton of family. All my best friends are from NT, and um, I, I really kept a lot of great relationships. So I moved back, and I met my nephew, my great nephew, actually. It's my niece's son played volleyball for the Lumberjacks. So I go back to the high school. I'd not seen anything in that new alumni center, the new gym, the theater, nothing. It was all brand new. So enjoyed the game. Uh, my wife and I were leaving and I see a sign above one of the hallways that says North Tonawanda Athletic Hall of Fame. And I said to my wife, I said, I, can we take a few minutes? To, I don't didn't even know NT had anything like this. So we walked down the hallway and Ed, if you saw it before, uh, we, we kind of fixed it up. It was small plaques. None of them looked alike. They were crooked. They were dusty. A lot of the pictures were fading. They were 10 feet off the ground with print about that big. And Jack Ramsey, as I referred to earlier as a classmate and Coach Ramsey's son, was on that wall of fame. And I brought my wife over and I said, look, I went to school with that guy. Can you tell me why he's on this wall? She couldn't read it. It was so high up. So I looked at her and I said, honey, Something's got to be done about this. Would you mind if I talked to some people and tried to take that project on? And she looked at me and I knew she'd say yes anyways, but she said yes. Um, so, Ed, what became or what started out as a as a project to do better plaques, perhaps, turned into the vision that it became and what you saw. Uh, we reached out. I, I, well, let me let me tell you about some of the people that were involved. In, you know, Keith Maranta was the first guy I reached out to. You know, Keith, he's one of your friends. I didn't know him that well, but now we're great friends. He's from your class of 75. And I call Keith the unofficial mayor of North Tonawanda because he knows everybody. He helps everybody. He's done so much. And Keith became my wingman. Um, he and I agreed that we needed to do something on the Internet. Keith created the website and it really led to a lot of our success. That, so that was part one. I got Keith involved. Then I reached out to Chet Weech, Chet, a guy I respect the heck out of. He was our captain. He was a friend since Gilmore School. Um, Chet actually wrote a letter to our team senior year. We're in the locker room before the TNT game. 
Chet was away in the service and he took the time to um, write this, this letter to the team. And that letter was read by coach Ramsey and it really pumped us up and motivated us and helped lead us to a win. And, and Chet would have been the perfect guy. And he was, so he, he, even though he lived in New Jersey, he spent a lot of time. He, he solicited a lot of his class of 73 people and was a great addition. Uh, Rosie DeMart, Angela Donato Johnson, um, Johnny uh, 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 Montesani, who you know from his sure. experience, success in the Football Hall of Fame. And, and then a guy named Russ Peters, class of 75 also, who <laughs> Russ is a very generous man. He put out their $15,000 matching uh, donation so that if we received up to 15000 in donations from others, he matched everything dollar for dollar. So without Russ pushing us over the edge, I don't know if we would have completed it like we had. But I got that committee involved. Um, John Shermani was another guy. Myron Annis was also very, very critical in our success. We just kind of, as a group, started to shoot around ideas about, well, are the plaques the best way to go? Uh, I worked in the IT industry for 38 years, and I was aware of the fact that touch screens were coming into prominence. And we've all seen in a museum or if you go out to, to some kind of an event that a lot of things are on touch screen. You can see about George Washington. You press a button, videos will come up with him information. So I started to do research on that. And I said, look, if, if these things are physical, they're going to ultimately be destroyed or get lost. Let's do something electronically. So that was a big part of the project. We ended up investing over $28,000. The school is still paying some licensing fees on an ongoing basis. But uh, I took 1,700 photographs of various athletes, of yearbooks dating back to the 1920s. It was a labor of love, but COVID was perfect because the History Museum used to let me in when their doors were locked. And I'd sort through one or two yearbooks, take a picture, crop them, label them, store them, and then put them into the the company that we ultimately ended up selecting um, out of Rochester to uh, to remember and honor the great athletic and arts history of our school. Um, we then discovered that if we would have put more plaques up, the fact that there were 18 windows on the athletic side and another 10 or 11 on the art side, the UV rays coming in through those windows would have destroyed whatever we put up. So we ended up covering all those windows and every boy and girl sport um, famous coaches from North Tonawanda, a window dedicated to Coach Better, and even one for the cheerleaders. We put mosaic of various photographs uh, across the decades. Um, the Basketball Hall of Fame has recognized every one of the inductees is on that window with their name. We did the same for the wrestling because uh, their wall of fame was up in the wrestling room where nobody ever went. So those windows, um, and on the art side, we went by decades, decades of arts. So from the 1920s all the way up to the 2010s we have pictures of students performing doing their arts um we're, we're very proud of that and then you know we finish things off with the lumberjack wall which if people haven't seen it i hope they'll go to the school it's a 12 foot by 12 foot actual lumber to represent us lumberjacks with the big lumberjack logo in the middle that's lit up with led lights and it looks really cool so Thank you for the compliment. It's 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 a lot of effort, but it worked out great. Is that project complete or do you still have some work in progress that's happening? We put the final things up. We actually ended up putting up an inductee board where all of the inductees into the Wall of Fame. And, and sadly, there's there's less than 40 inductees, Ed. And if you think about 130 years of athletic history to only have 40, we're either a very elite uh, school with, you know, with with a small group of elite uh, athletes. Uh, I, I think there's been somewhat of a disservice done that uh, that we don't have more. And the same on the art side. There's about 37 inductees, I think, on the art side. But we we put up inductee um, recognition walls. Um, we uh, put two trophy cases and we took old trophy cases that were kind of falling apart, stacked with trophies that you couldn't even read or see. And we really upgraded them with um, honoring all the five NT State team championships. There's photographs of each of the teams. There's their plaques are suspended and the cases are lit up. And then we've got a case at the far right of the wall, which are great moments from NT athletic history, 
also lit up and um, some great pictures in there as well with some basketballs of the high scores, you know, with their names on it, the all-time leading soccer score, things of that nature in that case. So, yeah, we're done. And we had extra money, um, thanks to people like Russ Peters and the 350 or so generous donors. We um, gave out six scholarships last spring to graduating seniors. We we had a really detailed process to select the, the people that were the award winners. We had um, three athletic and three arts winners that were going on to college. We gave out two $1,500 scholarships and four $250 scholarships for a total of 4000 we have enough to do that this year in the spring and next year, 2024, I mean. And so we'll be uh, we'll be helping students like I got helped by the Football Hall of Fame, um, help uh, move them uh, into their college years. So we're real proud of that. One final question. We've talked about a lot of different things during this conversation. What would you like to talk about that I haven't brought up? Um. I uh, found this card, and I don't know if you can read it or not, but I just want you to know that uh, I gave back to the uh, to the Football Hall of Fame. I think I was, what does that say? Number 409. <laughs> I, I found that card, and it reminded me that in 1976, which is the, when the card is from, I became a dues-paying member because it meant so much to me, and I wanted the, the Hall of Fame to keep going. And I, I tell people all the time about the great organization, what you guys are doing for the films, what you're doing for the interviews and the scholarships for students and the spaghetti dinners. It's incredible. And I'm very, very proud of it. There's very few organizations around the country that uh, that that have that recognition and are organized in such a way to do something with it. So thank you and, and all those other guys as well for what you did. Um, I also found this card. When I broke the school long jump record, it was a 20 year record set in 1954. I, I broke it in 74. Um, this is what Coach Sternan did. He goes, Hey, Baron, you set the record. You gave me this card. Today, the kids, you know, get plaques or whatever. But back then, it was just, uh, Hey, you did it. Congratulations. Now you move on and do something else. Did Coach, so, Sternan, get, did Coach Sternan give you a firm handshake when he handed that to you or hearty, what? A hearty handshake. It was a hearty, hearty handshake. handshake. Beautiful. <laughs> John Barron, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming and joining and having this conversation with me today. I wish you well. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Thank you, Ed. You're a good man. And I appreciate the time. Take care.